Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1185 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland. Coming to you um, during the All-Star break, late in the All-Star break, we will say. And if you missed it earlier this week, I talked to the same gentleman, Ben Ladner, about the Hawks and where they are this season. And uh, a couple days, maybe even one day, I'm not sure when you're listening to this, but later on in the week, we're back to talk about the Eastern Conference. Ben, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be here. We took like a 30-second break between recording. So thank you for your service. Yeah, a little behind-the-scenes secrets for people. (laughs) Um, but yeah, we talked about the Hawks already. We, we have some of that stuff back in, but I want to spend most of the time kind of talking about the Eastern Conference pecking order on this show because it doesn't, of course, it, it of course affects the Hawks in the short term. It even affects the Hawks in the long term because one of the questions I get all the time is like, you know, who do you need to worry about in the future? There's the whole shakeup about Ben Simmons and James Harden and all that stuff. We'll get into all that. But for me, the headliner is this. There are seven teams in the East from one to seven separated by a grand total of five games at the all-star break for comparison's sake the suns have a six and a half game lead on the number two seed warriors in the west so there is more room between number one and number two in the west than there is between number one and number seven in the east and even beyond that number eight in the east only two games behind that so it's pretty crazy right now um all these teams are good the Hawks are, of course, not in the top eight at the moment, which is unfortunate for them. But um, Ben, what do you even make of this? Is like, I feel like my default is like almost flipping coins. Like I have some opinions for sure, but the, these teams are so bunched together, particularly the teams that I trust, and then the teams that are kind of off the radar, like Chicago and Cleveland from from being beginning of the season. I have a hard time kind of parsing this stuff. So, are you having a more clarity than I am at this stage? Not really. I'm I'm really excited for the East playoffs, but like you, it, it does kind of feel like more of a trust thing than a what have they done so far this season thing. Like, I think Milwaukee is the favorite in the East, and right now they are the fifth seed, you know. And But like you said, I mean, they're not separated by much. So fifth seed and one seed, not a huge difference. But the fact that a team that's currently not slated to have home court advantage if the season ended today is my pick to come out of the conference kind of tells you what you need to know. And and maybe Miami is the team that they have looked like over the last few weeks. Maybe Boston finds a way to get into the mix and emerge as a, you know, a co-favorite or something. I'm skeptical of that. Maybe Chicago is for real and they just kind of blaze through the first couple of rounds of the playoffs and look really good. Same with Cleveland, but we don't really know much about those teams as currently constructed as playoff teams, you know, whereas with Milwaukee and even Miami to an extent, kind of Brooklyn, although Frankly, I'm not really considering Brooklyn as a factor right now in the championship <laughs> picture. We can maybe talk yeah. more about that. Um, you know, Philly looks good, but they're going to be integrating a pretty big variable into their mix over the rest of the season. So I think right now Milwaukee is the team that I trust the most. I think when healthy, they've maybe played the best of any of these teams. Like I've been most convinced by what I've seen from them at full strength than I have from maybe other than Miami, pretty much any team in the conference. That said, we haven't seen some of these teams at full strength at all or in quite a while. So, again, just a lot of variability here, a lot of lot of like insufficient evidence. You know, it's like you can you can make a case based off of facts for each of these teams. But all those facts are either flawed or incomplete or whatever it is because of the strangeness of this season between injuries and covid and um, trades and everything that's been going on. It, It makes it really hard to get kind of a clear picture here. That said, I'm, you know, like I said at the top, I'm super excited for the playoffs because I think any matchup between the top, really the top eight seeds, whoever makes the playoffs, like all of the first round matchups are going to be really, really compelling. And I think there's going to be a chance for an upset, not only of like a two or three seed, but potentially the one seed. And I think a lot of that's going to come down to matchups, who matches up well with whom, who has the personnel to slow whom down, you know, who doesn't have an answer for whoever. And and that's kind of going to be what determines a lot of this. And I'm pretty fascinated to see how it shakes out. Yeah, I agree. And I would also have Milwaukee number one 
right now for for the playoffs. It's the same. It's not the same team. It's a very similar team to last year. Giannis is out of his mind still. They have a lot of strengths. They are established. They are experienced. But uh, it, it's kind of a jumble. I could make pro and con arguments for every single one of these teams if I had to right now. Yeah. And the, the crazy thing is I'm going to sound like a homer, and I think you know that I'm not. But uh, even if you were to throw the Hawks in to the top nine and take the Hornets out, if you remove the Hornets, I think pretty much any of these teams could beat another one of the teams in a certain in a, in a, in a seven game series. Obviously, there are situations where, like like I said, I, I trust Milwaukee more than the rest of these teams. I'd pick them over anybody. I think at this point, but would it stun me if the Hawks beat the Bucks in a series? Not really. I mean, they almost. I mean, they, they took them to like pretty deep last year in a series with a, with, a, with a similar cast of characters, and that goes a little bit further down. But I sort of, sort of prove a point there. Like Toronto is kind of a weird team, but if they play Cleveland in a series. They might be favored in that series. Like that yeah. might happen. They might be the Vegas favorite if that series started today. So, and not it's not me piling on Cleveland, who has a top five defense this year, but they're the newcomer. Them in Chicago, in particular, Cleveland is the team that like nobody saw coming. I know I was low on Chicago and wrong about that, but at least some people thought the Bulls, you know, given their moves, were going to be a good team this year. Nobody had Cleveland being a good team this year, and they've earned it. They've been playing great. Uh, I can go down the whole list, but like another one trivia question for you, Ben. Who's number one in the Eastern Conference in, in uh, net rating right now? Because I, I know the answer. Do you know the answer? That would be the Miami Heat, right? Uh, no, no, sir. It is not the Miami Heat. Uh, oh, they might be number one in cleaning the, the glass. Cleaning, cleaning the glass yeah. has it as the Heat. Yeah. I had a feeling it was it was that was that was the case, but uh, Boston has the number one raw net rating wow. in the Eastern Conference. They are plus five point four right now. They are fourth in the league behind only Phoenix, Golden State, and Utah. So. I don't necessarily buy that, but if you want to get crazy, they've also had the best net rating in the league since January 1st, like Mm -hmm. in the league, better than Phoenix. Like that's a month, that's almost two months of data at this point. So pros and cons all the way down. Like Miami has been good this year. Obviously they are playoff built. They built this team specifically for the playoffs, but I cannot stop thinking about them getting just blasted by Milwaukee last year in a series. (laughs) I, I can't, I really can't. I'm not. And maybe that's, maybe that's on me. But they were non-competitive in that series. Yeah. And that happened like less than a calendar year ago. So Philadelphia is so weird. Anyway, we'll go sort of team by team at some point here. But uh, it, just to illustrate how crazy this is, and we talked about it before, but no one, no one deep in the stands really, really scares us. Washington, yeah. New York, uh, no thanks. So it's kind of a 10-team group. And I feel like I'm picking on Charlotte, but Charlotte feels like number 10 of 10 to me. Uh, maybe it's because they're 1-9 and nine in their last 10. They're not playing very well right now. That, that would be... That, that yeah that would contribute to the, <laughs> that would contribute yeah. to some of it and i also just don't buy it okay so i'll try to form this in some coherent fashion uh, i want to ask you about the teams that made the big moves first so one of them we'll start with uh, this might be a little bit shorter conversation maybe it's a little bit longer conversation is the sixers so philadelphia turns the ben simmons crater of nothing from this season uh plus seth curry and audio drama which is not which is not nothing seth curry is a good player drummond's been playing well for them into James Harden. And this is the hard one because we have not talked, we have not seen him, him play with Philadelphia, but it's that whole nuanced discussion. Our favorite word, nuance. Uh, they now have the offensive career that they never had on the perimeter under this regime. But you also have a player in James Harden that has some notable flaws. And uh, I'll just ask this. Is this going to, is this going to work? Like, do you kind of, do you buy in here? Do you buy into the Harden and B partnership? Like what did you sort of see from that trade? Not only just, not, not only just asset wise, but like actually on the floor of this season, like, do you like what they did for right now? Yeah, I think against the backdrop of, of the Simmons situation, like given that, like you said, they were literally just getting nothing from that not roster a- spot, you know? So like relative to that, yes, I like this. I think, because you almost have to think of this as trading Seth Curry and Andre Drummond and dead salary for James Harden because Ben yeah. Simmons wasn't going to play again. And in with that framing, I love this for Philly. So I think I think that's probably the way to look at it. That said, I think there are going to be some serious fit questions to work out over the, the course of the rest of the year. And you know, when Harden comes back and actually plays, is going to have a lot to do with how quickly they can figure that out. Um, I think the the question worth monitoring for Philly is, is just where is, where is the point at which Harden and Embiid meet in the middle? Because I think they are going to have to kind of meet each other halfway stylistically, but where in the great distance between Joel Embiid's game and James Harden's game, 
is that meeting point. And I, I think that's going to be the interesting thing because Joel Embiid is the best player on the Sixers. I think that's pretty clear. Yep. And this is the first time in James Harden's prime that he'll have played with a player who is clearly better than him. I thought at the time of the Chris Paul trade to the Rockets, you could make a case Chris Paul was maybe a little better than Harden. By the end of that, it was clearly Harden. I, I do think that uh, maybe that's your, uh, your, be, your being low on Kevin Durant bias coming in there, Ben. Because I, I do think that Kevin Durant was clearly better than James Harden, but not everybody agrees with me. Which I so that's kind of to your point. Oh, it was like oh it was a very you're right. I, I completely, I, I completely whiffed on that. No, you're but, right. I think, but no, yeah. I will say there were people in the I would say the very online community, people that I think are smart though that were that were saying Harden is the best player on the Nets yeah. last year. I, I didn't I, I believe should, that. I, yeah, but alas, I should amend what I said. J- okay. Kevin Durant was the best player on those teams. I do think. You could make a statistical case that it was Harden. I would not. Could. I would not um, argue that case necessarily. But but even <laughs> then, would I, but I would. James go. Harden at least got to play like he was the best player on the team, right? Yes. He got to play the role that a best player would play. I don't know if that's going to be possible in Philly to the extent that it was in Brooklyn. Hopefully, Doc Rivers will stagger and beat and Harden, and they'll each <laughs> get to kind of be the guy. I say hopefully because you know Doc it's Rivers Doc has a history of not necessarily. <laughs> doing that um so we'll see but that would be my hope and and if that's the case you know harden has 15 20 minutes a game where he can be james harden and just play Harden ball and do all that and that's pretty effective especially if it's your second unit offense and then Embiid will have his pockets where he can be joel Embiid, dominant post monster who destroys everyone in the lane but you know you don't make this trade for james harden to be your backup point guard you make this trade for him to start and close games and play a significant amount of time with joel Embiid. And I don't think their games are incompatible because they're both extremely talented. They can both shoot the ball. They're both malleable enough. Neither of them are Russell Westbrook offensively or defensively, frankly, for that matter. (laughs) Um, But, you know, like James Harden likes to run pick and roll and get downhill and throw lobs to his big man. Joel Embiid isn't a lob catching big man. He's not really even like a pick and roll big man. You know, he wants to he wants to initiate offense either from the post or increasingly from the perimeter. Um, or at least catch the ball in his preferred spots on the floor, which tend to be the block or the mid range. And so if, you know, if James Harden's doing his thing, where does Embiid fit into that? Is he just a, a spot up shooter? Is he the role man? Are you like, you're going to have to kind of stretch both these guys in ways that they're not used to. And I think the flip side is Embiid, you know, like I said, he likes to post up. He likes to run his offense from certain parts of the floor. And he likes to kick the ball out to spot up shooters who shoot catch and shoot threes. James Harden is one of the most catch and shoot three averse players among any high usage guard in the entire NBA. He's just, for whatever reason, has a phobia of catching and shooting for three. It just is not something that he does. (laughs) And he's one of the least active off ball movers in the league. You know, how is that going to work when Joel Embiid is doing his thing? That's not to say it can't work, but I think they're going to have to figure out what actions they can run where both those guys are unleashed in a way that's, you know, fully threatening to the defense. You know, how can you, how can you get James Harden to tilt his game a little bit more toward, you know, like running off a screen to catch and shoot for three or making a backdoor cut or something, you know, playing off of Embiid without the ball. How can you get him to do more of that? How can you get Embiid to play around Harden without the ball? Like, these are the questions that I don't think there are clear answers to right now. And we'll get, clarity on those questions over the course of the season but i'm really really fascinated just given the nature of these two guys games how like how that meeting point works out and and where it is i totally agree and i have uh, more to talk about with philly before we get to that it were from our sponsors on the podcast today nba fans prize picks is fantastic if you're looking for daily fantasy option for the nba then you have to check it out right now because prize picks is daily fantasy made easy I love it, and I know that you will too. Price Picks is easy to use. You can use two to five players and over-under on their projections. It went up to 10 times in any entry. It's just you against the projected numbers, which makes it very, very easy to use, and entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. That's under a minute to do the entire thing. Price Picks is safe. and offers fast withdrawals. If you use the award-winning app on the App Store and Google Play. Also, there are a variety of options with Price Picks. You can offer any prop that you could think of, points scored, to rebounds, even steals, and they have mixed sports entries. So if you like... More than just the NBA, you get into baseball when it starts up, college basketball, soccer, MMA, etc. You get that cross sport uh, sort of angle there, and that definitely helps you out with prize picks and the entertainment factor as well as your expertise. And for a limited time, there's an exclusive no-brainer of an offer for all of our listeners at Prize Picks. 
Fifty dollars free if a player in your first prospect entry scores a single point. But you have to use the promo code NBA to take advantage of this offer. That's right; it's an exclusive offer available to Locked On fans only. Sign up today. Fifty dollars for free with promo code NBA if a player in your first entry scores a single point. Check it all out at Prize Picks. All right, Ben. I wanted to follow up on something you said there, and it's like necessarily i think you're right on all those points and i am probably lower on the harden and bead pairing as a result of those things i think defensively is where i'm a little bit more worried than some yeah just because you know this is very simplified but harden in traditional pick and roll defense is not good, not good. <laughs> uh he's uh he's been he's he's proven to be uh acceptable in switching schemes where he can use his size and his bulk and his strength and he is strong Hands. Yeah, I think he he's he's strong. He's got some. He actually has some real strikes in defense. Like you can't ignore that. But him and Embiid don't really work in simpatico. And maybe you switch one through four, and that's what they end up doing. Um, but I I'd, I'd, I'd be curious. And also, you mentioned Doc Rivers. Uh, he would he would not be the coach that I would choose for this team at this point. Um, that doesn't I... mean that doesn't mean it can't work. And this is not me saying Doc's terrible because I don't think that, that's not true. But I, I think that there are some things that I am worried about staggering for one, just being creative. Doc is not the most creative head coach in the world. And I think you might want a little bit of that um, with this team. So we'll see how this all works. I mean, I think it's almost more of a long-term concern because Harden for all of his stuff has bought in when he first gets places. <laughs> like the first season usually goes pretty well. Like last year in Brooklyn, there were no issues that anybody found yeah. out about, about Harden. He was kind of just, playing well and he got hurt of course that and that really kind of ended up maybe contributing to them losing but he was a pretty good uh in terms of like buying in doing what he was asked to do passing like not not necessarily dominating the ball the same way that he has in the past like he was really deferring is a i guess is the word i'll use it's easier to do that when you have kevin durant and Kyrie irving but he did it um so maybe that's more of a long-term concern i just I also worry, like, is Philly that good around them? Like, it helps to have those two stars, but mm-hmm. not to go super deep into the numbers, but they've been a good team this year, but they've also overachieved when compared to their metrics this season, Philadelphia has. And that's a lot of that's credit to Embiid, who has an MVP-level campaign going. He's been incredible. But when you you trade Curry, which you had to do in this deal, not, I mean, we agree on this, uh, but you trade Drummond, who I'm not the biggest Drummond guy, but he's the best player backup they've ever had for Embiid like that's that doesn't matter like five percent um and Curry has been a great partner with Embiid for a long time those guys work very well together um so I don't know if that's that loss is going to hurt them you know Maxi is the better long-term play but is, is he the greatest fit with James Harden I would say probably not to be honest with you so there's some questions that I have you saw Tobias Harris who I think is probably underrated as a basketball player because of his contract being so bad but he's still not the perfect fit either with these guys. So I have several questions. I think that the, the talent you're buying in, it's a very, this is a very Daryl Morey roster. Now Daryl Morey yeah. believes in talent above all else. And he's shown that with his roster moves, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if the word is skeptical or what, but I just kind of didn't buy Philly as a legitimate contender before this move. I think they had to do it because it raises their ceiling, but there's some risk. That, that's for sure. For sure. And and I the thing you said about the the Daryl Moreyness of it is I my the when I wrote about this immediately after it happened, that was kind of the way I closed the piece was you know, Daryl Morey always prioritizes star talent and, he'll tell and you figures that. the rest out later. But now you <laughs> actually you. do have to figure the rest out. And that's yeah. gonna be the interesting thing. You mentioned the defense too. Daryl Morey himself, he kind of talked about this. He went on the rights to Ricky Sanchez, uh, I think like last week yeah. or at some point. And, and he talked about this with frankly, more candor than I was expecting. And he did admit like, yeah, there's going to be some kinks to iron out. Like James Harden likes to switch on defense. We don't run a switching defense. Joel Embiid <laughs> is one of the best drop big men in the NBA and NBA history, frankly. Yep. You know, how do you, how do you work that out? Like you're going to need James Harden to get over a screen if you want to maximize Joel Embiid's defensive talent. So, I mean, all that is going to be, you know, kind of, kind of thorny. I, I think what it kind of comes down to is just, well, you know, at the end of a close game, like, are you really betting against the team with Joel Embiid and James Harden? Maybe, maybe you are. I think there are situations in which you would, but that's at least like a defensible sort of uh, retort to, to, to the skepticism is to say, well, you know, we have maybe the best player in the world and probably a top 15 player in the NBA who, who is better than that as just a pure offensive creator. Yep. So 
you know, like that, that on its own is, is it's pretty scary. good. It, if you can yeah. figure out just like a passable fit between them. It certainly justifies the, uh, the risk. And I think the most important thing is just remembering that they were getting nothing out of Simmons. So it's that interesting, yes. uh, you know, that one, two, uh, I'm going to change gears on you real quickly here. And, sure. uh, this is, this is me artificially tearing. So if you, if you disagree with it, please correct me, but I'm kind of lumping in the Chicago, Cleveland, Toronto, maybe even Boston group, those four teams as like, I don't know what to make of them kind of thing. And I, I'm doing that also to ask you, like, is there a team or maybe even two out of that four team group that you believe in more than the others? Because they all have uncertain track records. Boston's been around as a core for the longest time, but they had a bad start this season. They had a dreadful season last year, for instance. Um, and then you throw in like this weird Toronto team that's playing seven guys. We talked about in part one of this conversation, Cleveland's this brand new team on a block. And then Chicago is tied for first in the East right now, but they were, uh, they have some noticeable flaws too. So like, do you like any of these four teams as a playoff unit? I, I would lean if I had to pick one of those four, if you told me one of those four teams makes the conference finals, for instance, I think my prediction would be would be Boston, but yeah, I kind of I kind of lean that way too. I asked the question not knowing what I would say, and then as you said it, I was thinking, I think he's going to say Boston, and I kind of agree, just yeah. because I, I trust their defense more their defense, than anybody yeah. else's anything. And I think yes. maybe the the counterpoint would be that Chicago, while I'm not a believer, uh, they do have two legitimately high end shot creators. And that stuff matters in the playoffs when things are grinding in the half court. I just don't know if they can guard, man. Like I, I understand that what, when they have Caruso and Lonzo available, they were pretty good defensively. But I, I don't know if that's going to play up in the same way in the playoffs. We'll see. But it's for me, it's one of those two. Like with apologies to Cleveland, they're just probably a year or two away at this point. I think in my mind, and they've been awesome this year. I think Darius Garland as a one man shot creation team basically has been great, but they just don't have a lot. I mean, Karis LeVert raises their floor, but I don't, as much as this, this pains me as a Michigan guy, not a big Karis guy at this point in terms he, of, he doesn't setting. do anything for me. Yeah. Uh, for, I mean, you know. he, I think he helps them in terms of like what they just didn't have. It was so glaring what they didn't have, like, and they overpaid to address it. But Garland right. was quite literally the only guy on the team that could dribble a basketball for like <laughs> months before that. Once, Ru once Rubio went down, it was it was jar to watch them play yeah. without without when when Garland had to sit for like the eight minutes a night, it was Rajon Rondo and like prayer. They had, they had nothing Pangos. else. I mean, I mean Hawks legend. Um, but regardless, I, I just maybe it'll make me look silly. And my apologies to Chris Manning and the Cavs folks, but I just I don't buy it. And then Toronto is so weird. So yeah, I, I think I'd go Boston too, just because of the defense. Yeah. But I still don't buy their offense to be honest with you. Like it's been better recently. But there, I've I've watched too many Celtics games. This year. I'm sure you have too. Too many Boston games this year, where I'm just like, this offense is dreadful. Ugh. like dreadful. And it shouldn't be that way, and they have too much talent to be as bad as they've been at times. But it's been like molasses. Dude, but, but I I wrote about this before the Derek White trade. It was they ran their offense like they were the Clippers. But the problem is, <laughs> Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are not Paul they're George. Not good, they're not as good as Kawhi and Paul George. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and so they're just basically creating these highly difficult mid-range jumpers or even like pull-up threes but they're just not good shots they're all taking these contested shots anyway i think i think white improves their flow quite a bit like you i still don't trust their offense in a play like i, I trust their 18th to... right now cleaning the glass to cite your preferred uh, yeah. yeah that's that's not a, an offense that makes the conference finals and it's a lot better than where they were two weeks ago yeah. it's a huge improvement so i i think they probably like there's at least the potential with them that Jason Tatum heats up in a series that Jalen yes. Brown really gets going and, you know, finds a groove, especially against the right matchup. Can they do that three, four times in a row? I don't think so, but they can do that maybe once or twice in consecutive series and, you know, get to the conference finals or something, but you know, like, can they consistently score? I don't think so. I feel the same way about Toronto. I, and, and in fact, I, I think Brown and Tatum kind of give Boston a, a gear that even Toronto doesn't really have in the playoffs. Agreed. And I know Toronto has been decent on offense in the regular season, but I think some of that probably goes away in the postseason. That said, I think their defense is, is pretty menacing, but you know, I, I don't think their best defensive five is as good as Boston's best defensive five. You know, as much as I like OG Ananobi and Pascal Siakam and Fred Van. Bo Reed, Boston's so. best five on defense is terrifying. I it's mean, insane. Yeah, truly it's, terrifying. it might be the best in the league. And they actually have six. I mean, they have a way to go small, 
and do the white smart backcourt with Brown, Tatum, and Robert Williams, or they can change one of the guards out for Al Horford if they want to play big. And yeah. that's still an awesome defensive unit because Al communicates like crazy and does the stuff that he does. So they really have six guys that they can kind of play with defensively. Now, offensively, trying to play that Horford with non-shooters is not going to be great. Yeah. But uh, And also, this is some kind of getting get the question that I have for you at, the, uh, at some point here is like, there's a chance that the teams that are considered to be the top like established teams, like your Milwaukee, Miami, and Philly, they could all end up on the same side of the bracket. That's that's the craziest thing about this Easter conference right now is like, what if the teams that we like end up at like one, four, and five in the playoffs? Because <laughs> that, that that's the way, I mean, that's the way it happens sometimes. Like that's how you get a team that maybe shouldn't quote unquote be there breaks through because they have matchup help. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be the pessimist, the people, you know, outside of Atlanta, people might, I've certainly have argued this before. I know I've heard this before last year, the Hawks got the Sixers in the second round. And if they had to play Milwaukee or Brooklyn in the second round, do they win that series? I don't know the answer to that, but I, but I said before that series, would I, would I rather play Philly or Brooklyn or Milwaukee? And my answer was Philly. Yeah. And that might be a even worse version for whoever, one of the teams this year is like, if I have a choice between if I'm the six seed this year, and I can play in the in the second round, you know, Cleveland, or if I, in the second round I can play Boston versus being you know being the five seed, and I got to play a good team and then Milwaukee or whatever. Like there's some real matchup concerns across the board. Yeah, and maybe that's what it comes down to. Maybe it's just you know Miami or you know whoever draws a really favorable matchup, and they only have to play one of the four best teams. And then you know, it there's happens. there's your Eastern Playoffs. Conference Finals representative. I mean, it happens in the happen in the West too. Like, there's this is well discussed, but like Dallas having to play the Clippers two years in a yeah. row, which is like their worst possible matchup, and they had to play them twice in a row. Like that stuff happens in the playoffs. That's that's the nature of the beast. Um, in fact, to that end, I have a specific question to ask you that will sort of inform this. Before we get to that, a word from our sponsors on the show. Football is over for this year, which is unfortunate, of course, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props, and where the next coach might be headed, betonline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of the sports scores, the podcasts, and the news this season. It's not just basketball either, even if we love basketball in this space. BetOnline is also your source for hockey and boxing and soccer, and auto racing, UFC, Baseball when it happens, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the Olympic coverage that's uh, been happening in the last couple of weeks. Head to the website right now, bet online, or use a mobile device to learn more about the trends and all of the action this season. One more time, check out betonline.net, bet online where the game starts. Ben, this is that question I teased before the break. If you had to pick a team to finish number one in the regular season, I want to stress in the regular season in the East, who would you take? The Miami Heat, I think they are yeah. just playing the best. They're their fourth in net rating on cleaning the glass in the entire NBA, first in the conference. Um, Boston, like we've said, has been playing really well of late. They're just too far behind to me. To, I mean, although, like we talked about, the gap is not that big. I just think where Miami is now and the way they're playing right now, they probably have the inside track. Chicago has overperformed relative to their point differential, and Immense credit to DeMar DeRozan for helping do that. But given the state of their roster right now with how many guys are injured and just the inconsistencies that they've been dealing with, I, I would actually expect them to slip a little bit. I'm surprised they haven't slipped, which again, you know, that's to their credit. But I think eventually that would probably start to happen. Again, Milwaukee, like if Milwaukee could just keep their best guys on the court and stay <laughs> consistent. Yeah. I mean, again, they're the best team. I, I think they're the best, like, you know, if if at the if you said we're starting a new regular season right now, who would you pick to finish first? I'd take Milwaukee. I just, you know, they don't seem to be pushing hard for that necessarily. And maybe down the stretch, if they feel like there's a matchup they want to try to get, they could finagle that, you know, the, the seating a little bit. But I think right now Miami, if they can stay healthy, which is always the big question for them. But but even then, I mean, I think that kind of gets to a, a reason why I actually trust Miami in the regular season and in the playoffs is that their depth is a lot better than I expected it to be. So even Strong if they do agree. get injured, you know, you throw Caleb Martin in there and he's perfectly fine. And, you know, he's giving you solid wing minutes in a way. It's that, really wild. Like, I yeah. think we talked about this before the season started. I think you and I talked about this exact thing. We said we hate their depth. The, not good it, enough on the bench. Yeah. yeah and I, I stand by it from when I said it, because if you look at who it was, 
it was these guys who have done nothing and they had yeah. nothing proven. But then you throw in like, yeah, Caleb Martin, they got stuff, they've got stuff out of Max Struess, they've got stuff out of Omar Yurtseven. Gabe like, Vincent. Gabe Vincent's been a solid enough guy. Like it's yeah. so I mean, it's I guess it's Miami, so it's on brand for them. But it's it really is wild that like depth's not a concern for them because it should be a concern for them. If you look the way they built their roster, it should be a problem for them. It just hasn't yeah. been. Particularly when they have like heroes best time. Like they've had some injury stuff too. And like Jimmy's been in and out of lineup, Lowry too. It just hasn't mattered. Um, quickly, they also play a style where they're just so solid defensively and they move the ball so well on offense yeah. that they're just going to create easy looks and take away their opponent's easy looks on a night to night basis in a way that Chicago definitely isn't on defense in a way that, you know, Boston can't really offensively. Some of these other teams, they don't have that two way just hum that Miami can get into. You know, they don't have just that like that that institutional system that they can lean on which I think Miami has on both ends of the floor. I, I still think that, um, at least judging what I read from people that I think are smart, I think I'm probably still a touch lower on Miami than some are. Like I've seen them in the contender tier, like with like alongside Milwaukee, and I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but I will acknowledge that they've been better than I thought they were going to be for sure. And like, I do trust them more than the teams that I laid out before, like the Chicago, Cleveland, Boston, Toronto group. And also, you know, they're also number one right now. So yeah, to answer the question that I asked you. I think Miami is the smartest bet to be no, to be the number one seed when you factor in team quality and where they actually are in the standings. I do think Milwaukee has a run in them if they want to have a run in them. Yep, and they're only two and a half games back, which that matters. But I mean, this is your uh, clean the glass just a reference because you're here. Uh, I believe the number is with with Giannis, Drew, and Middleton on the floor. They're like plus fourteen. Yeah, crushing teams. Which is just unbelievable. Like, And to throw a little bit of water on our Milwaukee love fest, the Brook Lopez thing matters. If he doesn't yes. ever come back, they're not quite the same team. Like, Could they still win these without him? I think they probably could, which is my faith in the three guys and the system and all that stuff. But they're not the same team if it's just what they have now and not Brooke Lopez. And I have no idea what's happening there. So that's, that is a caveat that, that doesn't matter. He's not, you know, he's not, the, he's not a star level player, but Brooke Lopez is their fourth best player when he's right. So worth pointing out that he's not, uh, not been around. I agree. I also think just for the record, Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton are a lot better than most people seem to think they are. I agree. <laughs> you know, so if we're, if we're just doing the, who has the most talent thing, Milwaukee has arguably the best player in the NBA, and they also have, to me, Drew Holiday is like a solid all-star level player this year. I know he didn't make the team. Middleton is like a fringe all-star, and he did make the team. They're both so, they're both top, I mean, conservatively top 30 players in the yeah, league. Yeah, I mean, they, they just have, like, there's so much. Like, here's a take. Chris Middleton is what people think Devin Booker is. That's uh, that's, that's spicy. Uh, my, I, don't, yeah. I don't necessarily mind. I, I've never been as high a Booker as some are. Um, but that's that's interesting to me. What do you but mean? Like, what do you he's mean by the that? Kind of, like gets his own shot wherever he wants. He just does it efficiently, and Booker doesn't. You know, and, <laughs> and he's a better passer and defender. So, anyway, I I like Milwaukee. I'm with you. Hold on, I'm, but... I'm gonna go on Twitter right now and just say Ben Ladner yeah. <laughs> believes uh, Chris Middleton. I'm just kidding. Chris Middleton uh, is an MVP candidate. Blazing yeah. takes from Ben. No, but I look. I think you're right on those on those two guys. I think Milwaukee. That top three is just like kind of unassailable. If they're out there. I trust them more than everybody else. Um, there's a limit to that. Like if everybody else is hurt, maybe not. But, uh, you know, I I think that they are the one team, if you maybe choose one more to pass Miami in the standings in the next 23, 24 games, it'd be Milwaukee because they really could go 20 and three the rest of the way. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised at all by that. What about like, what if, what if the Harden Embiid fit is much cleaner than we think and Embiid continues playing like this and Philly's yeah. the one seed? Well, that's the other thing about like, that's why they're kind of in the middle for me. Like, in terms of regular seasons, especially, it's Miami because of where they are. Then you get into Milwaukee, who I trust the most, and they're tied with Philly in the stage right now. But yeah, I mean, I think they'd be, they'd be next. They'd be next on my list of teams to pick to be the number one seed, just because as long as Embiid is right, they are capable of just winning a bunch of games. It's kind of weird. This is there's some sample size noise in here, but you know how good Philly has been at home in the Embiid era. Like they've always dominated yeah. at home. This year yeah. they're 16 and 13 at home. I like, saw that. I, I heard that on their broadcast where they've been really good on the road. Yeah, which is so weird. Home. I mean, there's some noise in there, but last year, just for example, they were number one in the East at home. They were 29 and seven. Uh, the year before, they were a pretty terrible road team, but they were 31 and four 
at home two years ago. And they were 12 and 26 on the road. In 1819, they were 31 and 10 at home. So like the entire Embiid like superstar era, they have dominated at home. And this year they're like above 500, but barely. It's kind of a weird, noisy stat. But Maybe I wonder they want if they the just get corrected. Seat. Maybe they should hope to fall to the five seed. It's kind of like Brooklyn and like all the uh, the game theory of like if Kyrie can yeah. play home, like what 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 uh what seed do they actually want in the playoffs? I don't so know the Kyrie answer to that. Play. But yeah, I I do think that I would have Philly as my third most likely team to be the number one seed, and I feel like that's disrespectful to Chicago because they're tied for first right now. But I, I think yeah. that if I had to, even with the two and a half game lead, I still probably would take Philadelphia. But listen, I say all that, and so did you. I would not be surprised if if Chicago was number one seed just because of where they are no, and, how many, and, and how many games there are left. So that that's how tight this is. Like I'm not the biggest believer in them, but they they are tied with Miami right now. And they have a two and a half game lead on Philly and Milwaukee. Like that that matters in late February. Yeah, I Chicago. I would pick Chicago to kind of stay at that two seed type of level. My concerns with them are more in the playoffs, just Agreed. because I think at some point, especially because of the way they match up and the way some of these other teams in the East are constructed. Their, their two best defenders are Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso, both of whom By are kind far. of point guard sized defenders. That doesn't do you a ton of good against Giannis or Embiid or Jimmy Butler or Kevin Durant. Or even know? Middleton. Like, right. who's guarding Chris Middleton on the. Take, take Giannis away, which you can't do, obviously. But who's guarding can, yeah. Chris Middleton <laughs> on the Bulls? Like, I think you probably put Lonzo on him and, like, just pray. But, yeah. like, he's got three inches on Lonzo and 30 pounds, and Chris Middleton is a freaking monster. Yeah. Like, I, 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 that, that's one of the that's one of the reasons I agree with you. Like I don't buy. Let's let's say Chicago gets Boston in a series. How are they going to? I'm probably lower on Tatum than 95 percent of people. Same. There is nobody on that team that can guard him. Yeah. No one on Chicago Jalen Brown that can guard. Yeah. And the, and again, that where you get into. So yeah, they have. They they were playing really 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 well early in the year on defense. Surprising to me and most people, but most of it seemed to be that they were just terrorizing on the perimeter. And that's a credit to Lonzo and Caruso and Vooch was actually okay, um, et cetera. But when you're playing Levine and DeRozan all the time, both of whom are bad defenders. Now, Levine's better than he used to be. He's still not very good. DeRozan is bad. My apologies to DeMar, who's having a fantastic season. He's a bad defender. So those two guys are playing all the time, and you don't have anybody. I mean, Patrick Williams was like they're going to be their maybe their X-factor guy, and he has to play all year, and he's also 20 years old. And, like, they don't have anybody that can guard those big wings. It's like, it's like if the Hawks just it's the Hawks podcast. It's like if the Hawks don't have DeAndre Hunter. Yeah. It's like take take Hunter off the team and then watch the Hawks try to defend on the perimeter night to night, and that's what the Bulls have on the wings. Now they're better at guard than the Hawks are, obviously, but man, in a playoff series against Boston or Brooklyn or Milwaukee, or I mean Harden, I guess is a better matchup for them because you could just put one of the guards on them and sure. hope. But even Miami, like who got Jimmy Butler? I don't know. None of those guys. Am at a bio. So, yeah. Uh, like yeah, at, at some point, Levine and DeRozan are going to have to guard someone. That's the other thing we, because we're talking about you, not only just the, the best player on each of these other teams, but all of them have those other ancillary threats. And so you kind of go down the line and it, I actually, in a weird way, I kind of think the, the Harden Simmons trade kind of helps Chicago because I thought I thought they were totally screwed against Brooklyn if they matched up because they had three creators who yeah, even if you could him, yeah. take the first two away that third guy Levine and or DeRozan has to guard someone. has to guard that guy no I, I'm totally with you especially when you know it's, this is my time to throw in the DeMar DeRozan All Star guard joke because he's not played guard all season but uh, if he's he's basically playing the four with their best yeah. lineup their best lineup this year has been the two defensive guards Levine DeRozan and Vooch. And like DeRozan is their supposed to be their like their big wing defender in that group. Yeah. You can't guard anybody like that. So no, I that's a good point actually about Brooklyn because you know Brooklyn is a lot easier to guard now. If nothing else, they're a lot easier to guard now than they were before at full. At strength. least in a man to man setting. Correct. I think that the transition defense could be harder, the rim pressure could be harder, but perimeter man to man, I think they are. Well, and they're the team, and we can get to them at least briefly here, because obviously, regular season-wise, they have no chance, I would say, to be in the top two. Um, maybe they get to three if Durant just goes on a tear, but they're seven games back with yeah. 23 to go. That's that's not going to happen to get to the to actual top two. But, I mean, 
I think you're lower on them for what, what I can glean from our two conversations here. Yep. But do you fear them in a playoff setting if everything is right? Like, it, let's say in the dream world, Ben Simmons is integrated and playing like Ben Simmons used to play. Is that a title contender? Like, can they actually can they can they get there for you? I'm not, I I could sense that you don't believe it's going to happen, but can they even get there? Yeah, they could. They could. I would favor Miami, Milwaukee, and Philly probably ahead of them for this year. I would love and to watch Philly, Brooklyn. State. Philly, Brooklyn for a number of reasons, but not even for the reasons like you and I are are sickos. The narrative of that series would be what would dominate. It'd be the Harden yeah. Simmons thing. I want to watch that series to see how Brooklyn defends Joel Embiid <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I'm a basketball sicko. And like, can you imagine that series? Like, how are they going to guard Joel Embiid? Oh, they're not. I can tell you well, that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that, and obviously only us will be doing that. That's yeah. like the seventh bullet point down the list of what's interesting about that series nationally. But uh, anyway, you were saying. No, yeah, I think I was just going to mention. I think certainly against whoever comes out of the West, I would favor the Western Conference candidate over Brooklyn. But you know, for the like moving forward next season, I, I like Brooklyn's chances a little bit more. This year, it's possible. Like I think the the upside for Brooklyn, if everything fits together, everything you know, everyone kind of hits the ground running when they come back from their injuries and other absences. The the, the potential there is pretty high. I, I like what they can do. I think Simmons solves a lot of of defensive issues for them. Not all of their defensive issues, but a lot of them. I think he gives them a transition element that they didn't really have. I, I think it, it's kind of the thing we talked about in when we were talking about the Hawks on the last episode, the, sort of the opportunity cost of adding that third guy. You know, if you take him away and replace him with a defensive guy like Ben Simmons, maybe you can, maybe you bump your offense down from like a 123 offensive rating to like a 121 but your defense goes from a 114 to a 110 or something. So the net gain there is better. I don't know. I think that's the theory of the trade for them. It just seems like there is right now, you kind of just survey where Brooklyn is. There are too many variables for me to confidently say that they will even, you know, remotely reach that best case scenario that we're talking about. So is it possible? Yeah. Is it, is it likely for a team that's currently in the eight seed and kind of sucks without their best player? I would say no. Yeah, I mean they're two and twelve in the last fourteen before the All Star break. That's that's a stretch that no that no good that no great team has. You know what I mean? Right. I know it was because Durant was out. That's a part of it. But we didn't even mention like there's still a chance Kyrie can't play in half the playoff games. Yeah. What like, what if they play Toronto in the first round and he's just not that he just able can't to play. play? Yeah. I mean that's that is very much in play. I'm not saying it's going to happen because Toronto and Brooklyn are probably going to both be in the six well five to eight range. But yeah, I mean, it's that's a factor that we're not going to discuss beyond just <laughs> mentioning it just because there's no upside there. But I think that there is no guarantee that anything has changed and that he could suddenly play in home games. And they're not good enough this year to overcome him not playing in half of their playoff games. I agree. Even, even if you thought that they were going to be their fully formed functioning self, which could happen. I mean, Kevin Durant is really good. And if Ben Simmons is Ben Simmons from two years ago, then maybe. But it's just so weird. I mean, it's an underrated factor, just the weird factor of all of it. Like going into a playoff series, knowing that your second best player can only play in three or four of the seven games before it starts. It's just bizarre. Everything is bizarre. Yeah. Joe Harris is like been out forever. And I was just going to mention Joe out. Harris. He's their fourth best player on paper. I mean, maybe fifth now behind Seth Curry, however you want to say that. But like they need Joe Harris and he just hasn't been there all year. And their fourth and best, their fourth and fifth best, best players right now are Patty Mills and Seth Curry, both of whom are offense first, pretty poor defending guards to go along with Kyrie Irving. <laughs> like it, the roster is just bizarre. I mean, they have a lot of talent. Yeah. Now they have Gorian Dragic on the team. I don't know why, but he's on the team. <laughs> it's just what they needed. Well, it's, it's funny. Like I was seeing that framed as like Cam Thomas insurance. And I was like, no, that's not a thing. Like it's, it's Kyrie can't play in the playoffs insurance. That's what I think that is. But regardless, I don't know why Goran Dragic signed in Brooklyn, not to do the whole non sequitur about this, but like, why would he go to Brooklyn? I have no idea. Did he have no other offers? I'm confused. But yeah. Uh, anyway. I kind of think Cam Thomas is the Cam Thomas insurance. Listen, uh, live or die by Cam Thomas. Cam Thomas is willing to shoot the basketball. He 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 definitely is uh, is shooting the basketball. That is all yeah. I have on that. Um okay, so 
I'm going to ask you to, I think we both have already said Milwaukee is our pick to make the finals out of the East. You can change that if you'd like to. And beyond that, who is your number, who is your second best bet to make the finals out of the East? If it's not. Ooh, I, I like Miami. I really do. I, and I, I, I kind of hope the Milwaukee Miami matchup happens. I want it to happen later in the playoffs. I, I would Milwaukee like to see smoked it. them a year ago. I saw it well, with but, my own eyes. You could flip that around and say Miami <laughs> smoked them two they years did. ago. They did. That's, like, that's absolutely true. It's uh, it, and that's what makes it so fascinating is, is just, you know, was the bubble just a total fluke and Miami's not that good or, you know, what I, or was I, last I, year. I, I tend to believe that more than not a total fluke. I, something in my brain will not allow me to buy into this Miami team for whatever. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it is, honestly, because it, it really was in my mind coming into the season. It was the depth. And now that's not really a concern. I'm in more than I was. Don't get me wrong. I think that they are on my sure. short list. But I just – there's no way I would pick them in a series against Milwaukee. Like, no chance. Unless Milwaukee's not themselves. Yeah. And then, I don't know. I mean, but I have enough questions about the, about the rest of the teams where I might be with you. And that seems crazy because I know right. what I think about Miami, and it's not in line with that. But if you go team by team, I think they're better than Chicago. I think that Philly-Miami would be fascinating on a number of levels. I'm not sure I pick in that series. I think maybe Miami, but I have to see. I, we just don't know about Philly. We haven't, we haven't seen it happen. Yeah, um, I would Cleveland, bet Philly I know and Miami, Miami in some order would be two and three. Yeah, I think so. I think so for me too. I mean, Boston's kind of scary to me, um, but I'm not quite there. I just the offense. The offense. Is, the offense is, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't see it. So yeah, I think I think we're on the same page. I'm higher on Brooklyn than you are, just because I have seen them be incredible with Kevin Durant when he's right. playing. Um, but even then, as long as Kyrie's a part-time player, I just can't do it. Like if, and there's a chance there's a chance the law changes or whatever. I'm not making a sense on that whatsoever. But if he's able to play in the playoffs in full, they're they're still pretty scary to me. Yeah. Just in general. Um, but I think I, without 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 that being assured at this point, I think it's some or Miami Philly. Maybe, maybe Miami just for safety reasons, because Philly has we just don't know. We haven't seen it. So yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah. There is a tier gap for me though. I think still I have Milwaukee in their own tier, um, or maybe it's like a half tier, but they're they're sure. in their own category for me. Yeah, I would probably lean that way too. The other thing with Brooklyn, I think even if they do kind of catch lightning in a bottle, you know, and the, everything breaks right, they're going to be coming from the seven or eight seed, and that's just yep. the, the deck is kind of stacking stacked against them there. They're going to have to beat at least. Or prob- I mean, the standings could shake out in a way where actually being the seven seeds better than being the four seed somehow. But like, in theory, they would have to beat probably two of the four or five best teams in the conference. Yep. That's kind of tough to do. Um, I th- I think. Oh, I, th- going back, I, I, maybe this is a useful way to frame it. You said earlier you like Boston's defense more than anyone's anything. Out of, I think, those four, out of those four teams that we were talking about. Okay. Sure. So, but I think if you go through the East and you kind of look at it that way and you split each team into two categories and you rank each unit. So, you know, maybe we think that like, I don't know, Milwaukee's or Boston's defense is the best unit in the Eastern conference or whatever it is you, but you rank all of the units. I think Milwaukee and Miami have the highest average of ranking. Yeah. of their offense and defense, which that's is why true. I trust them more than these other teams. I think that's a good way to put it. Like that's pretty simple because, and maybe that's the different differentiator between them and Philly is because we talked about it before, but I just don't know what that defense is going to look like with James Harden. I'm pretty mm-hmm. confident they're going to figure out the offense. Maybe that's foolhardy of me, but I think there's just too much talent there to not be good on offense. I think as long as James Harden is himself or kind of himself and it beats so good, but I, I do worry about that defensive everything. I mean, Embiid's yeah. awesome at the at the back end, but it's not like they're overwhelming with defensive talent elsewhere. Like they have Tybal, but he's a one-way player that's like tough to play a lot on offense cuz he's so bad. Like Harris is okay on defense, Maxi's not very good on defense. Like I worry about Philly's defense at the end of the day. Yeah. So, they I mean they essentially have one point of attack defender and one rim protector. Not great when you're talking. Those, I mean, the point of attack defender is really freaking good and the rim protector is really freaking good. But everyone else is kind of well, and you know. I, I mean, not to say it again, but like, I don't know if I mean, I guess they have to play Tybal, but like, he's one of the worst offensive players in the league. Yeah. Like, he's terrible on offense, like, terrible. 
So like you, you kind of have to play him to make your life easier on the other end of the floor, but he makes your offensive life harder. So yeah. having one way players is difficult and almost more so on defense than offense. Um, oh, sorry, on offense and defense, like having a guy who can't play offense, you know, there's always the bring, bring it back, bring it back around to the Hawks. There's that whole discussion about like Trey Young is a one way player, all this stuff. I would much rather have someone I have to hide on defense than someone who cannot do anything on offense mm-hmm. in the playoffs. That's just my opinion. But I think it's I think it's easier to deal with a Trey Young size hole in your defense than a Matisse Tybel size hole in your offense. That's just my opinion. But I, I believe that. Interesting. Yeah. And I love and I and, and I and I love defense. Like you know me, Ben. Yeah. I'm a defensive guy. That hurts my soul to say that out loud. <laughs> but I, I I mean I've watched too many Andre Robertson series in the playoffs when like you can just not guard him. Like it's Matisse Tybel, if I'm playing the Sixers, I'm not exaggerating. I would not have anyone on the same side of the floor as Matisse Tybel. Like he make him shoot anytime he wants to all game yeah. long. Go ahead, Matisse. Have fun. It's hard. It's hard to overcome that. I mean, it's obviously over, oversimplified viewpoint is to say you're playing four on five, but you truly sure. kind of are playing four on five. Yeah. Yeah. And I think against the wrong matchup, like I, the Cavs especially could be an issue there because you could just have Evan Mobley guard quote. I'm using air yeah. quotes for people who aren't watching video, exactly. Matisse Thibel, and then he's just hanging out. At he's the just rim. hanging out near the rim. I mean, we can go through this all day, but there are certain matchups where a bad defender won't kill you. We saw two of them in the playoffs last season for the Atlanta Hawks. They played the Knicks and the Sixers, neither of whom could take advantage of Trey Young on defense. They tried. They did a decent job at times, but they, they, they never made it actually happen. But we saw at times, like, the Hawks just didn't guard Matisse Tybel. The Hawks just didn't guard guys on the Knicks at times. And yeah. it made their life miserable. And that's obviously a, a central view to what this podcast is talking about with the Hawks. But... It applies elsewhere. I promise you, if you watch one-way players in the playoffs, and I, I think that Tybal is this year the most prominent example of that because they have to play him because of what we just talked about with their defense. But man, I, I'm not picking on him, but he's really, he's really bad. Yeah. On this. Well, it also, I mean, it gives teams like the Hawks, for instance, a so hiding spot somebody. for their Trey Youngs, right? Because not only is is let's use Trey and Matisse. Let's say that's the matchup. Not only is Thibel not going to like beat Trey Young off the dribble or post him up or like do anything by himself. But even if you try to use Matisse Thibel as the screener, the Hawks don't have to switch that screen because they're nope. not worried about Thibel doing anything with the doing, ball <laughs> doing anything. as the screener, right? <laughs> so like if he gets yeah. the, the, you know, if he pops and he gets that outlet pass or he rolls and he gets the pocket pass, he's not doing anything with the ball. So the Hawks can keep their primary defender, let's say DeAndre Hunter. They did this against the Knicks last year. They can keep the primary defender on the ball handler let Trey hedge while the guy gets back and then Trey just gets back to his man because the guy's not a threat to do anything, even if he gets the ball. So I agree. I I think those players can be really damaging and sort of on the subject of one way and two way players. I, like I was kind of getting at earlier, I think Miami and Milwaukee's balance on both ends really gives them a leg up in a conference where there aren't a ton of teams like that. Like even Brooklyn, who I think we agree if everything goes right, can be really good they're very much a one-way team. Their defense is yeah. not going to be moving the needle for them in the playoffs. Chicago, Same. heavily slanted toward offense. Cleveland, Boston, and Toronto are all heavily slanted toward defense. So all of these teams just have, are, they're weak on one end of the floor, or at least in the playoffs. They're going to be, they're just not going to have enough juice to me on one end of the floor or the other, which is just going to allow if they run into a, a Milwaukee, you know, maybe maybe the Cavs can can defend Milwaukee reasonably well but they can't score on Milwaukee. You know, maybe the Bulls can score on Milwaukee, but they, they don't have an answer for Milwaukee's offense, you know? So it's it's kind yeah. of that issue for all of these teams. I uh, I totally agree. And the lack of weaknesses really uh, kind of gets magnified. If you go down with the way that you just did it and just talk about like, which of these teams have two trustworthy units, there are only two of them, basically, that have yeah. two, 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 two of those units in the East um, anywhere. So maybe those maybe that separates it. We'll see. And I will say, I think there's a chance Philly gets there. I think there is that chance. Yeah, they have the best chance to get there. I I would agree with you. Even as someone who is worried about their defense, uh, they at least have Embiid, who makes a lot of things a lot easier on defense. Like he's he's not quite, yeah, he's not like quite Rudy Gobert, but like he's on the next half tier down defensively. And, you know, you're you're only going to be so bad on defense with Joel on the other on, on the floor. Right. Like you're probably going to be average if you have a bad if you have a bad perimeter, like we saw with you, even Utah this year, for instance, using the Gobert comparison. Like they've been pretty mediocre on defense. But when he left and he, when he was out for two weeks, they were the worst team in the league on defense. 
So like, yeah. that's the importance of that guy. And Embiid is that kind of guy. And they can be okay on defense in a way that like, if you line it up like your game a second ago, do you trust Philly's defense more than Chicago's defense? I think I do. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I definitely do. Or like more than Boston's offense or more than Toronto's offense. Like I think Boston's I totally offense do. is the interesting one. Cause I think Maybe. that's sort of, that's sort of the Phillies defense for Boston. Like, especially now. The... Yeah. Especially with, with Derek white in the mix. Now they have another ball handler. They yeah. at least have uh yeah, I guess it's kind of a good comparison that you just brought up. Like Philly's defense has Embiid and Boston's offense has two, six, eight shot creators. Yeah. Like that should be enough to be at least okay on the offense. Now that hasn't always been the case this year, but they should at least be able to carry uh, their floor up a little bit higher. Um, Ben, I kept you for way too long, which I just realized. We, we, just, we just get to talking, you and I. No, that's all right. Can so, I ask you one more question? Absolutely. It, it doesn't have to be uh, real long if you don't want it to. Who's Go the ahead. best player in the Eastern Conference? <sighs> who's having the best season or who's the best player? Who Who is the best player right now? Giannis. Okay. I think I, I think agree. It, I think I could see an argument for Embiid as having the best season. I would rather have Giannis. And I think... Um, I think because of the voter fatigue, Giannis is not getting the proper love and MVP as well. I think Giannis I is, should be a more prominent MVP candidate this year than he has been. Um, I would take Giannis. It's not a shot at it. I think it beats awesome. Um, and I, I would have Durant close to them if he was healthy. Um, he's not right now. So yeah, he'd be a, an obvious, an obvious third. And I might have him above and beat in a like best player if they're healthy conversation, but uh, I would take Giannis. I think I would too. Yeah. I would go Giannis and be Durant. And then like you're getting, you get into like I think, Trey I think Trey's, Butler. I think Trey's next, honestly, I really yeah. do. I was, I was about to mention him just to make sure we said it out loud, but I, I would rather, I mean, you could say that Butler's the playoff test and stuff. I would rather have Trey than anybody else we haven't talked about. Like, I think, I think he's better than Butler. I think he's better than DeRozan. I think he's better than Levine. I think he's better than Harden at this point. Yeah. Um, I think I agree with that actually. <laughs> Which I mean, um, that, that, may not, that, may not, that may not be a mainstream opinion, but I think Harden, the, the current version of Harden, is not the guy from three years ago. He's no. not. He's still really good, but he's not that guy anymore. And yeah. I think Trey is better than, yeah. You know, I think he's better than Tatum. I'm trying to go on the list of players. Yeah, I think he's he'd be next on my he'd be the fourth guy I would choose behind Giannis uh, and Beat and Durant in the East. So shout out to Trey. Trey, Trey. Trey's really good. Uh, all right, Ben. I'm glad you asked, I'm glad you asked me that because let me get some more Hawks takes in at the end. Yeah. Of the <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, one final time on this marathon two-part episode that I really, really, really appreciate you joining me for. Please plug yourself, written content, the occasional tweet, etc. Sure, yeah. Uh, you can follow my work, my written work at The Step Back. I write about the NBA uh, pretty much once a week, um, weekly column, kind of just picking out stuff that I find interesting about the NBA. Um, you can also check out the Read and React NBA podcast. If you, I, I'm sure there are people listening to this who also listen to that so uh but for they, those who they don't should. they should if they haven't already for those who don't uh you know hopefully you find it a good place to get some some thoughtful discussion about the nba as a whole um and you know some some measured some measured takes uh nuance from, ben use the yeah, word yeah. again so, uh, if you're into that kind of thing you know uh check that check that out uh otherwise i don't tweet much but it's at b ladner underscore if you're looking for links to articles podcasts whatever it is um, to the extent that I am active online, that's where it happens. So I think you have the right approach to Twitter at this point. Uh, I think if I ever stopped covering the Hawks and just like covered the league, I would tweet a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh... I, I really find myself now almost exclusively tweeting about the Hawks, which is part of the gig in my mind. But like, I, I thought about that the other day, um, like how much of my Twitter, uh, I'm not even sure what the word is. Um, performance is the, that's the wrong word. Anyway, how much of my Twitter is, is associated with just like live tweeting Hawks games and like right. throwing out Hawks stats? If you took that stuff away, like I don't really, I don't jump into the takes on everything else. No. These days. Well, see, just, my my thing now is I, anytime I feel the need to, or not even the need, anytime I think like, oh, this would be an interesting thing to tweet. I just like text it to my friends, you know, and, yes. just, and then we just talk about it and like, you know, it's it's more interesting. Can <laughs> we do just that chat about just it like, offline? Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, thank you, Ben. I sincerely appreciate it. People should be following your work everywhere. Uh, I would say that whether you were here or not, I uh, fully stand I behind that. 
those words. Uh, as for everybody else, please subscribe to this show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And especially right now, I am told it's important to promote the YouTube channel. So please subscribe via the YouTube channel. Even if you're not going to watch it, it helps us to subscribe. I'm just passing along the information I've been told. And uh, follow Ben, follow me if you'd like to. And we'll see you next time.